Hello, Millennium listeners. This is Connor Tui, host of Millennium Live. I'm super excited to be doing an episode today. We have a company that is transforming brands, growing businesses, and making people's lives better. We have Modus here, and to talk all about Modus and creation and innovation, we have Jay Erickson. He is a founding partner and currently the chief innovation officer at Modus. Jay, thank you so much for joining the Millennium Live podcast. It's great to have you here. Thanks, Connor. It's great to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Cool. So today we um, this is all about the rock, rock, roll, and resonate. So mm-hmm. before we uh, before we get in, and I want to know all about that. Could you uh, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? I know you know Modus has been around a while, over twenty years now. So. Just um, maybe about modus, the motivation of starting the company, and uh, sort of the uh, the overall story of this uh, user experience and why it's so important. Sure. Yeah. We're modus. We've been around for over 20 years, and, and we like to say we sit at the intersection of product and people, um, and often at the intersection of engineering and UX. And part of that is um, up until 2015, we were two different companies. We are more of an engineering-focused company more of a UX focused company. And a lot of companies in our space, you know, say they do everything, right? But um, it's hard to find a company that has those things really in balance. And we feel like that's really the sweet spot in the digital space is being able to have really strong UX, but it has to function, it has to function well and quickly. And all that experience together makes things really, really work. Jay, you have an interesting perspective on, on brand to demand marketing. And sort of, I, I want to talk all about it, but before we dive in, maybe in your own words, could you define uh, what brand to demand is for our audience? So brand to demand is about um, taking the practices that have been normally associated about building a brand and projecting your image and projecting your story out there to creating real demand and, and driving transaction. And a lot of times those have been sort of two siloed operations within an organization. You have a brand team and sort of the storytelling team. And then you have this demand gen, demand marketing, very tactical um, team. And we want to bring those things together in in, in a unique way and, and create what what we call you know resonance marketing, which is where those things really sing together to not only um, project your story and get people emotionally activated around your story, um, but then converting that into, into action and behavior. I want to talk about what it means to rock, roll, and resonate. I know, you know, Modus, you're creating creating digital experience to transform and resonate. So I I want to know, what does it mean to rock, roll, and resonate? Okay. So ultimately, you know, um, what what we're driving towards is that moment of resonance where where, uh, a customer is feeling... um, resonating with your brand to the point where they're they're interacting with you or they're, they're maintaining their loyalty, they're thinking about you, they're using their product. The rock and the roll part are sort of two distinct steps building towards that. So rocking, we like to say rocking to the same tune. Um, and that means working within your organization to build cross-functional teams that can collaborate effectively. I already sort of mentioned, you know, you often have like a brand team and maybe a you know general marketing team, and you have a you know demand marketing, or you know an IT team, and you have all these teams that are um, you need in order to do this well and have that singular journey um, and have people have a consistent um, story and consistent experience. You need all those teams to work together. So rocking to the same tune is about building trust, building culture across silos, and aligning the goals and checking in on that regularly and having sort of one message that is getting out um, through all the channels in a cohesive way. Um, And then rolling out the red carpet is really going back to that human-centered design. We're saying rolling out, roll out the red carpet um, for your customers, um, which means you need to treat them uh, and their experience above all else and elevate that. And that's really the core of human-centered design to say, what we are going to value most in this equation, what we're going to think about is the customer experience and elevating that to where they're going to keep coming back and they're going to have that loyalty. Um, and you know, our tradition comes out of um, design thinking that came out of the the D school at Stanford in the '80s, and you know, firms like Frog um, and IDEO and us were sort of born out of that lineage to have a set of tools and a framework to really put the customer at the center 
um, of, of the process and design things for them that are going to be differentiated. Um, and then again, that if you can do those two things well, really operate well cross-functionally in your organization, put the customer at the center in human-centered design, you will drive towards um, you know, resonating uh, with the customer and their experience and, and driving towards behavior. Great. Thank you, Jay. So, And uh, by the way, you've rocked and rolled with some great brands over the years. So what typical challenges do organizations face between brand and demand? Mm -hmm. So I already mentioned one of them is sort of siloed teams. You have these teams that are operating. They don't really have the same vision. They might not have the same the culture. They might have different goals. Hopefully they're laddering up to an organizational goal. And then I would say tunnel vision, um, that there's a lot of focus on maybe short-term results um, and um, and and thinking about sort of the internal value as opposed to the customer focus. People are trying to still tell the great story internally for the next quarterly, you know, meeting as opposed to uh, really focusing on the customer. So having the right um, vision um, and the right focus. And then I would also say there's an inability to be agile. But again, especially at large organizations, there's these sort of legacy um, rhythms and cadences of, you know, planning this annual process and this big six month planning campaign. And, you know, the world moves too fast for that. And we need to be doing experiments and doing them quickly and shifting as the customer's needs shift and learning and test and learn and test and learn and be able to execute things in a matter of weeks um, and not months. So we have to kind of retool our thinking around that. And, you know, even some of the largest brands out there, the largest organizations have these issues. So how is a company like Modus approaching these challenges and helping these brands? We go right at it. So in terms of that that first piece of silo teams, you know, we are often the convener and the glue because we can speak IT and we can you know speak in acronyms um, and we can speak marketing and we can speak storytelling. We can sort of be the the, the bridge to kind of help bring these teams together um, and manage the workflow. Right? If we're responsible for helping delineate that unified holistic customer journey. You know, we can sort of curate that and make sure that that information is getting integrated and be that that cross-functional glue. Um, and then bringing that <clears throat> customer-centered, user-centered, human-centered philosophy and tool set to the table and really knowing how to do that, having done that um, in, in a deep way for 20 years. Um, and we're here not just to, to be the experts. We also believe in sort of like teach a person to fish uh, kind of mentality of like we want everybody to level up on their own skills about about how they think about their customers and and to be able to develop personas and journeys and and do ethnographic research and and provide all this value um, that is going to unlock especially on the emotional layer that resonance which is going to be di the differentiated um, experience. You know, I want to address that. You, you know, you have over twenty years of experience and you've been doing this a while. And, uh, you know, you've worked with some amazing brands. I want to mention a few like Gibson, USAA, Sesame. I'm just kind of curious, Jay, about maybe a project that you're most proud of. And, you know, out of all, I'm sure the projects that you've worked on over the years, maybe there, there's a couple that stand out to you. Mm -hmm. I'm just, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a great diversity of, of clients we've had the privilege to work with. I think Gibson, especially as someone who, um, you know, plays music and we have, you know, rock roll and resonate where we're very uh, in part inspired by our work with Gibson. I think, um, you know, that's been, that's been a great relationship and helping them build their direct to consumer um, uh, relationship. And, that, and that's, again, it's sort of like helping an organization really transform from 140 year old manufacturing company selling to B2B to, to dealers to what does it mean to have a more of a direct relationship and transactional relationship and sell direct to consumer and that's a whole new DNA and way of thinking in the organization that we've been a part of that, the journey and that transformation. The experience of buying a guitar, owning a guitar is so isn't a very emotional experience. It's not a toothbrush, you know. It's, it's not even uh, you know a car is an emotional buying experience, but it, even more so, you're not necessarily being creative with your car. So, um, so that's been been really great to think about. Also, not only connecting with the historical customers, but expanding that into new demographics that haven't always been able to relate to the Gibson story, 
um, and more diversity, which is a part of the Gibson legacy. I mean, some of the 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 greatest um, guitarists who played Gibsons in the you know 50s and 60s were you know women and people of color that you know helping them elevate those stories to increase um, you know the, the 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 tent under which you know everybody feels feels happy to be being creative as part of the Gibson family. You know that's been that's been a great journey. The other thing that you highlighted, <clears throat> one that you highlighted that I'll, I'll, I'll mention too is. And this is another example of, of the value of human centered design is Sesame Workshop. We were working on their Latin American um, digital uh, content team. And we were part of the, I think it's the largest um, educational intervention um, in terms of numbers internationally, um, where we deployed a, um, a WhatsApp bot, which is its own unique thing because WhatsApp is a relatively closed environment for that kind of stuff. But what's great about it is you can very much control the interactions, right? It's not like SMS um, or some other platforms, <clears throat> but you can very much uh, control the look and feel and interactions where, um, you know, kids were seeing and, and, and parents are seeing and educators on the broadcast TV shortcodes, WhatsApp shortcodes to be able to interact with a bot to get additional um, uh, supportive educational content through WhatsApp on an interactive ongoing basis. Um, and that's an example of, you know, we're in the U.S., WhatsApp is not very prevalent, but we thought, you know, it is so prevalent. So you, you, we like to say we build the um, sidewalks where the people walk. Where is everybody in that market? They're, on, they're on, on WhatsApp. Okay, we need to, and we also need to know what country you're in and customize that because not all Latin American culture, despite what some people might think is the same. It's, it's every country has its unique <laughs> culture and unique way of speaking Spanish. And so being able to really customize that experience, that was very successful and, and had a big impact on getting educational tools into, into in, you know, toward to children. That's so awesome, Jay. I, I, I love to hear stories like that and and talking about the human experience. And and I feel like I, Gibson is just a, is a great brand. Uh, I own a Gibson myself, which is pretty cool and love to play and uh, that is a great way to sum up our uh, Rock, Roll, and Resonate segment of the podcast. And I do have a couple more questions for you, Jay, just before we uh, sure. close out. And you are Chief Innovation Officer. I want to talk about innovation. You know, it's innovation is something that you're extremely passionate about and, and, and co with collaboration with a lot of brands. But a lot of companies hear this word innovation. You hear it at you know a Millennium Alliance assembly. It's a buzzword. Everybody prefaces innovation with, "Oh, it's a buzzword." We're we're hearing a lot these days. But it, it has a lot of purpose and it has a lot of meaning. And I want to know, mm -hmm. as a chief innovation officer yourself, what is innovation to you, and what does it mean? So, I mean, I, I always like to go back on these definition questions to sort of the roots of words and really break down the word itself because there's a lot of information there. And so innovation is in novus, right? To be just to be in newness. That's really what it means, right? And so I think one of the traps with innovation is people think, oh, it's just about the latest emerging technology. And that's not what it is. It can be that. It doesn't have to be web three and chat GPT all day long. You have to spend in, you know, at least a significant amount of time uh, defining the problem to solve that you're going to solve, no matter what it is, right? And they say, you know, a well a well defined problem is half the solution. Start there. Don't start with what can we do with ChatGPT. You start with what problems do we need to solve, and then you can decide. And it's usually going to be something going to be solved with something new, because if it was solved with something that existed, it probably wouldn't be a problem, right? But sometimes that might just be changing the copy on some asset that already exists. That's innovation. It doesn't have to be driven by technology, or it might be, it might say, well, we have some tools now to do this differently. Let's use ChatGPT. Let's use, you know, this tool, let's use um, WebRTC, whatever it is. Um, but that's when one way, one trap to sort of avoid the buzzword. Um, and, but it is challenging, especially at large organizations where, you know, if you think about a startup, their entire, um, like, existence is newness. They're starting something new, like that they're, they're doing innovation just by virtue of being a startup. When you're a big established multi-billion dollar company, most of the there was usually some core innovation in the beginning where someone was a startup and they started a company. And then it becomes about defending the status quo and getting the most juice out of that thing as you can, right? 
So it can be challenging to be in that environment. It can feel like you're swimming upstream where most of the organization is there to not support newness, but get as much out of the, the thing that made them successful. Um, so that can be challenging and that shows up in different ways, whether it's just organizational resistance or underfunding. And this is what I call innovation theater, where you have you know, a handful of people and a small budget and they're running innovation, but they can't really do anything because they don't have any money. It can be really challenging. So I think really getting high level investment in it to say, like, if we don't constantly reinvent ourselves and adapt to this dynamic world, you know, we're not going to be successful. Um, so really getting that religion and getting it funded and then embedding innovation and innovation mindset across all teams. Every team in an organization, no matter what you're doing, should have some part of their uh, day or program or you know personnel that are thinking about bringing in new ideas, new technology, um, newness um, into into that. So it's so have a promote, promoting uh, the culture of innovation across the organization. I think is a way to help avoid some of those traps. Well said, and and thank you. And I know you you alluded to this already in that in that answer, but now that we've sort of broken down innovation, uh, the word itself, for organizations looking to get started with innovation, Jay, what are some of the steps that they can take to start this and maybe, or continue the uh, the innovation conversation? Yeah, I think if you're ready to start it, you're looking to sort of re-inject life into your innovation program, you know, I think it'd be helpful to talk to, to bring in some outside resources because it can be very hard. You have this fishbowl effect um, where you're kind of just can't see the water you're swimming in. So whether it's us or some other organization or, 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 or some, someone to come in and sort of help be, or it's a new hire, you know, or help, help be a, 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 a new fresh outside perspective is, is one really great way to do it. Um, and also just dedicating time and resources to say, we're okay, team, we're going to take these two days and we're going to go off site and we're going to do something that innovative um, and we're going to invest the time or we're going to invest the money and we're going to create a new position and their job is to be you know do x y and z around innovation across the organization and invest in it so i think um a big part of it is to is to is to actually invest in it and then going back to uh being very um discerning about what problems you're trying to solve um and it's usually the best problem to solve is probably not the one that's most apparent um, it might be something that's a little more beneath the surface. So really investing in, because as soon as you pick a problem to be solved, you've sort of taken other opportunities off the table. So I think, you know, having a really being very discerning about what you're focusing on and also having a process for renewing that. And so not get really focused in a certain area. And then you spend two years on that, you know, you want to have a quarterly or semi-annual process for reevaluating what are you focused on? What have you accomplished? What else needs to be focused on now? Because the environment is so dynamic. There's new opportunities and challenges coming up, you know, all the time. I mean, I love this conversation. And before I let you go, Jay, I do have one final question for you. It's something I like to ask on Millennium Live is a good uh, way to end the show. But, you know, I kind of just want to get your thoughts on the future. And, and you know, as some as a creator, a collaborator yourself, and, you know, we've been talking about creating these human-centered digital experiences and rock, roll, and resonate. Modus has been around for, I guess this is 24th year now. And where do you see 10 years from now uh, going and, and, and helping these organizations move into a, in, in that innovation stance and, and Continue, continuing to help brands create these experiences that facing those challenges that we might see in the future and nobody knows what the future holds but you know as we continue to see the effects of a chat gbt or, or a what ai can do you know mm -hmm. i would love to hear your thoughts on perhaps the future in any capacity you can take this question any way you want but um the future question is in your hands jay <laughs> Well, um, I am not an oracle, but um, <laughs> I I do think I've witnessed in the last 20 years, you know, a shift of investment from, I mean, when we used to have to build stuff, the amount of time it took to make a form 
work, for instance, on a, on a web page, you know, it was like, you have to do all this stuff in detail. All that's gotten easier and easier and easier. And now you just tell chat GPT to, you know, write, you know, this to, you know, I'm not saying it's that simple and engineers are always going to be valued and important. Um, but I think there's sort of a, a getting out of the executional details of things that, and, and that all practitioners are, are going to, um, have the opportunity, let's say some feel very threatened by it. But I think what that does is open up more and more space to think more strategically um, and to think more um, creatively and to think more ethically about where we want to be headed and putting our resources. And so that everybody is going to be pushed to be in a position of leadership. Um, and I think there's going to be less humans executing stuff and that means there's going to be need, there's more opportunity for humans to be leading and leading from a space that is going to have a, a positive impact, um, you know, on us as a culture, on us as a species, on the planet, you know, on our on 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 the other our other non-human inhabitants on this planet. So I think there's we have some big problems to be solved um, around the world, and I think um, if we if we are able to leverage these emerging technologies in the right way, it's really going to help us solve them. Well said, and uh, using that technology to really empower people and drive yeah. your business forward. So Jay Erickson, thank you so much for your time today on Millennium Live. It's great to chat with you. Uh, thank you again. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at a Millennium Alliance Assembly, and uh, please stay in touch with us because uh, can't wait to hear all about the exciting stuff that you're going to be doing in the next 20 years uh, at MODIS. So uh, thanks again for, for uh, joining the uh, podcast. and. Um, it's uh it's been a really great chat. Thanks Connor, appreciate it.